one. Bittersweet. It's our last talk in the applications track, but it's a great one. And I'm really looking forward to it. Please join me in welcoming to the stage data scientist at KeyBank, here to talk about recommender systems, Ty Tinker. Ty, would you join me on stage? All right, how do we look? Looks great. We're looking forward to this talk, Ty. Uh, the stage is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Piyush. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this is a great opportunity, and I've really enjoyed seeing some of the discussions that were happening prior to mine. I'm going to share slides here um, and make sure that everything is working technically um, so I, I don't embarrass myself right off the bat. So let me make sure this works here. All right. So, um, yeah, appreciate the confirmation in the chat. We uh, can see the slides here. So, um, my name is Ty Tinker. I serve as uh, in the analytics organization of, of KeyBank, uh, which is an internal organization specifically supporting a data science team within commercial middle markets. Um, when preparing for this talk, I stumbled across a TweeML podcast, which is hosted by Sam Sherrington, um, which explored the idea from Google research that we've likely all heard some form of before, um, that paradoxically, data is the most undervalued and de-glamorized aspect of AI. Um, so before I dive into my talk, I want to thank the organizers at Snorkel for bringing together the most undervalued AI conference of 2022. Data in production is often leveraged as an input to a function rather than as a function itself. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to put the spotlight on the data and labels that have fed the cutting edge work we've seen uh, the past two days. Uh, some, some really great work there. So today I'll be sharing um, a little bit about a project I had the privilege of working on in the past year. Um, I'll be discussing uh, data uh, processes and modeling within the business. Um, KeyBank, where I work, is, is in the early stages of a data journey. Um, it's rapidly growing. Uh, it recently partnered with GCP. Um, it also acquired AQN Strategies to head up the analytics organization I mentioned that I was a part of and is making massive strides to try and uh, modernize the business and, and, and support the commercial functions as well. I work in the commercial middle markets, as I discussed, which are our business clients um, that bring in about 10 million to a billion dollars in revenue. Um, and I was tapped to help a cross-functional agile super squad, uh, which is just, just a bunch of agile uh, jargon uh, meaning it was a group of people, data engineers, data scientists. We had bankers, executive leadership team members, uh, analysts, data supply chain members, a huge group of people who were all brought together um, to try and improve banker productivity. The recommender system um, lives within a broader initiative, which is called the Banker Productivity Initiative, um, which really took the approach uh, of providing centralized, accurate, and forward-looking insights uh, on top of data that had really not ever been brought together before. Um, it's to support our bankers who really are our quarterbacks for relationships with clients. So for the recommender system, move forward here. So for the recommender system, um, I will share, of course, overall system design, um, our target and feature generation process, uh, the selection steps, uh, our process of validation and testing, and then, of course, our uh, direct feedback and how we're incorporating that into our business rules. Um, we tend to uh, err on the side of, of customization uh, for the business. As I mentioned, we're early in the stages of a data journey. And so um, much of this process has to be uh, built with the end user in mind. We're not trying to build a system um, to the scale of, of some of the other recommender systems um, that have been discussed in previous talks or, or uh, researched recently. This is on a smaller scale, but its impacts are, are widespread. 
So um, when thinking about recommender systems, and I, I think I, all right, perfect, on the right slide. When thinking about recommender systems, we have uh, the generic system design. We have uh, initially um, a query of some sort, um, which, which uh, initiates an interaction between um, uh, an item store and then a feature store. So uh, given some user context, this query um, and a set of items, uh, the recommender system intends, of course, to provide recommendations which are expected to be good or provide something that's relevant um, to the user, and who in this case is the banker, not direct to client. So we select from two standard types of products. Uh, we have our credit products and, of course, our, our payment products. We also offer deposits. I don't want to leave those out, uh, but those are not recommended um, to the bank and and most cases, they actually don't require any level of selling. You may notice uh, with a keen eye that uh, we're kind of missing one of the components already um, that I mentioned, which is the query. Um, and this is a critical distinction from REC systems at massive scale. Um, we, we don't have an automated query which triggers our event. Given that we don't have um, millions of, for example, posts to select from to try and uh, recommend, at extremely low latency to millions of users, um, we have a little bit more flexibility with our models and can run them on a much longer schedule. Um, our users who end up being both clients uh, really at the end, end state and then uh, our, our bankers who are our direct clients um, can suffer from choice overload given the numerous banking products we have available. And so it's important to provide a, recommend, or a ranked list um, and our REC system was built to support the rapid human navigation um, of these choices. So if we don't have a trigger, uh, how do we know when to refresh our recommendations? Well, um, we coordinate, we work with people. Um, our two missions with this project, uh, one more explicit and one implicit, um, our initial mission was obviously to provide uh, recommendations which make sense for the business and, and help bank our productivity. But the, um, Implicit mission is to uh, build trust in data products within within our, our newly formed analytics segment. So in this case, when we don't have a trigger, we actually have to coordinate with the data supply chain team who's responsible for the input and output in our data systems. They also do a ton of work with authentication, um, data management, cleaning, um, everything that goes into that. And so when they refresh their systems on a certain schedule, uh, upon that we refresh ours. We pull our data. Uh, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail uh, of the system overview here. We pull our data into a raw data store, um, which is only available within our environment, so our GCP environment. We then create a client financials document, which is shared with the business. I'll get into a little bit about how much overlap there is between the system and the business, um, but that's directly shared with the business. As I mentioned, it's one of the first time we're bringing those client financials together. So as a part of, uh, as a part of that productivity initiative, we share those financials with the business. From there, we're able to generate our holdings data set, which is a binary matrix, uh, which I'll show in just a minute, which represents our, our zeros and ones, of whether or not a client holds a product in a particular year. Um, this, in addition to a set of client features, which includes financials, but also includes internal data, external data. Um, I'll share more of those features later, but uh, all of this, and then trended across 12 months, all of that data is fed into a product model, which uh, serves the objective function, which I mentioned, uh, which is generating a rank ordered list of recommendations. Lastly, um, within our system, we have a custom set of business rules um, that we develop independent of the business. So. Um, these are things like, like data checks, uh, output checks, performance uh, uh, levels, and, and then we actually select the products which we provide to the business. So if they're underperforming, we extract them, remove them, and do some external testing. All of these outputs are moved into um, the ranked items list. And then from that ranked items list, uh, we provide our model insights. So in an in initial load, so for our, our first quarter of insights that we provided, um, we didn't have to filter out any previously recommended insights. Of course, this is an initial batch, but as we provide those recommendations to the business, we of course uh, filter some out based on uh, the actions of the bankers that are engaging with them. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide here. So 
what's going into this model? Well, of course, we need to have an item store. Um, so we use a sheet, which is a binary matrix of client holdings. We generate this based on the revenue that we see from certain products across historical data. So we break out our, our historical data into uh, 12 months, January 1st to December 31st of revenue information. If we see a relevant amount of revenue generated for a certain product against a certain client, then we convert um, each point to a zero or a one. So if we see revenue, we convert it to a one. This gives us um, a, a set of series which are comprised of, uh, into a data frame um, that give us our item store. Um, so we filter out any new products. Uh, if we incorporate something new, uh, like for example, we now have a healthcare payment product. Um, it's too new to rate, too new uh, to incorporate into our modeling process. So it's currently filtered out. We don't model on these products. Clients with low to no holdings are also figure, filtered out. Uh, clients with no holdings uh, are not providing much information gain to the model. Clients with only one holding um, have an impact on the model that's, that's um, difficult to quantify. So lastly, we split out our train validation and our test sets uh, based on year. So our train set, uh, which I'll get into a little bit more later, but our train set um, is a rolling window, um, which uh, comprises of the, the most, um, the oldest data that we have until uh, it meets a particular year. And then we have one year of validation, one year of test, and then uh, we have an out of time sample that we test on as well for, for further testing. Of course, um, we need a little bit of context for each one of these clients. So we generate a set of features. I'd like to go into this um, feature generation process because it's a long one. As I mentioned early in the data journey, our mission here is to uh, make sure that we build trust in our analytics products. And so importantly, when we generate these features, we need to make sure that they are correct. Um, there's a labeling process in place which um, was not as effective as the one that we took. Um, essentially, our, our process was to um, pull in from numerous data sources information on, and I'll use sales size as an example, which is just the size of the client that we're dealing with. Um, we'll pull in data on sales size from a, like a profitability resource that we may have available. We check this data for its completedness, and if there's any issues with that, then we actually engage with the business and send out surveys to uh, each one of our bankers and require them to uh, improve or change or update um, this information. We segment out our clients to provide context to those uh, that specific metric, so sales size, and then try to understand whether or not it's an outlier or if it was potentially input incorrectly. And so we're constantly engaging with the business back and forth, making sure that in their source systems, they're updating information, making sure the data is up to date, because we're working with all really internal information here. This isn't, I mean, these aren't public clients that we're dealing with. We can't just pull sales size immediately. We have to actually get that from the business. So we try to increase and improve our data quality. Um, and then we bring in all of our data sources here. So that includes things like deposits, our risk rating, short-term debt, we carry out a waterfall approach to try and improve each one of these, especially for key metrics like sales size. Of course, uh, we have uh, a logical imputation uh, that I mentioned. Um, so we impute null values. Uh, we try and improve those um, from the business if we detect outliers. We really try and improve our data-centric <laughs> mindset um, and uh, all with this model in mind. Next, we move over to raw categorical features. Um, these are things like industry, geographical region, um, the client segment that we generated. Um, and we take these and we one hot encode them um, as, as a part of our feature preparation. Lastly, we actually um, extract our feature. Uh, so our feature here, or our target, excuse me. Uh, our target here is the list of zeros and ones for a particular product. And then we take the rest of the holdings information and we include that as well in preparation for our modeling step. So we have a lot of different features incorporated. Move on to the next step here. So all of this goes into our product model. Our product model is a tree-based approach. Um, we cross-validated several different models, making sure to test sampling techniques um, because our, our distributions were not perfect uh, or were not necessarily normal. Um, and we discovered uh, through, through rigorous testing that um, our, our light GBM uh, approach was highly effective um, and we tested various sampling approaches as well. Um, so each product model specifically gets its own uh, product approach. 
So we need to validate, uh, and and uh, that validation approach uh, focuses in on lift. When we consider a recommendation system, uh, we need to understand um, what it's providing to the business, and and our focus is on precision, really. Um, recommendations that make sense to the business. Of course, uh, that satisfies our, our first mission that we discussed earlier, which is um, providing useful tools uh, that will help banker productivity. Um, but precision isn't the only uh, metric that is necessary and useful. Um, additionally, we want to make sure that we're not uh, overloading bankers with false positives. Um, so these are recommendations uh, which are not going to lead to revenue. So what we do uh, to try and um, account for this testing technique and, and validate before our tests is um, we calculate lift tables. Um, these are an extremely useful approach um, to, to measuring the success or the performance of a model and actually selecting, sorry, not measuring performance, selecting a threshold of probabilities uh, for the modeling approach. So what we do is we um, generate a series of recommendations or a series of probabilities um, and then break out those probabilities from zero to one across 20 different deciles, the, or twentiles, excuse me. These twentiles represent a range of probabilities um, that our recommendations or our probability of purchase are uh, gathered into. So for each one of these bins, um, we, we generate a lift metric. Um, and so across each one of the twentiles, uh, as we move across, you know, one through one through 20, which represents a, a probability uh, range, um, we calculate the lift within that twentile. So from, you know, 100 percent probability to 95 percent probability, we have a certain lift. We expect that lift to be high on that end. And so as long as that lift moving along each twentile is high enough, and that's a threshold that we uh, gauge with the business, um, then we move along to the next one tile until it dips below um, that selected threshold. So in this example, uh, our selected threshold would be, or our selected twin tile would be six. The minimum probability threshold uh, would be about 0.25. Um, this could be a little bit off, just an example case. Um, and then our selected lift threshold is 1.2 here. So. We move that threshold over to our testing. So we only make recommendations when the probability is above that particular threshold for our product and then provide recommendations to the business. So before we get into um, kind of the business discussion here, uh, we make those recommendations on an out of time sample um, and test uh, the performance of that hypothesis. So if we uh, suggested that a client should purchase an agriculture or will purchase an agriculture loan in the next year, and it turns out to be true. That's a true positive in our case. And then, of course, uh, we, we calculate performance of the modeling. Once the performance is calculated, um, we make sure that our models are performing at a certain threshold before uh, incorporating them or including them in the business. So we're to the last slide here. Um, I'd like for this to go, um, or I'd like for this to be the time when um, hopefully we can have some questions generated. Um, this is an extremely important uh, component of this uh, model construction within the business. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, this is one of the first times that um, uh, this type of model has been incorporated uh, into the commercial segment of KeyBank. So it's important to consider not only uh, the performance of the model itself, but how its outcomes or outputs can be leveraged as we move along um, within, within this process. So. Um, as a reminder, for each product in the model list, which are selected by the business, as long as they're performing up to standards, we generate our categorical numerical features. Those are engineered and shared with the business uh, for use in other analytics projects. Um, we extract these best features. We extract several best features from, um, from this feature list in order to um, kind of inform our modeling. Um, those top features are shared with the product owners um, uh, and, and uh, product experts so that they can have some insight into what our model is generating. And then we cross-validate sample parameterize, uh, use correct parameters, um, cross-validate our parameters, excuse me, um, and apply the model once it's once it's been validated. So we generate our list. Um, we find that light GBM generally outperforms and those recommendations get distributed to the business. The last piece of this here is that when the recommendations are uh, made to the business, made to bankers directly, 
um, we generate two types of feedback, which um, are manually pulled back into the modeling process. Uh, the first type is, is implicit feedback. So this is um, like engagement with the tool, um, um, whether or not the leads that we're recommending are getting qualified or if they're just being left in a basket uh, untouched or unseen. Um, and then there's kind of explicit feedback, which is commentary that bankers provide on the, on the leads themselves. Um, these are uh, qualitatively measured. They're uh, kind of hand read um, and provide insight uh, when we actually uh, refresh and rerun our models. So uh, we take those business rules, incorporate them to the best of our abilities. And then from there, um, we have our, our feedback loop and try and do our best for the next data load. So um, I'm going to wrap up here. I have a few um, few extra thoughts, but I'm happy to share in the Q&A. Um, so I'm popping back over to the Q&A section. Ty, thanks so much for this presentation. That was that was great. And we do have quite a few questions coming in. So um, the first one is, what are your thoughts on showing recommendations for prospects? So people who are not yet clients. And you know, how can we increase recommendation relevancy for existing clients? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, as with recommender systems, the, the new user problem uh, can, can be a challenge. Um, so for uh, recommendations within the business, especially at Key, we would like to see some level of engagement with their actual data. So we, we would need to see um, availability of sales size or client information um, assigned risk rating um, before we could actually incorporate them into a recommend, recommendation engine. So new clients tend to be filtered out. Um, so that's kind of my cop out answer to that question, um, because there is, of course, a lot of opportunity with prospects. Um, so as long as we're finding a way to uh, incorporate that data or at least place them within some sort of client segment, then we could use um, matching algorithms in order to um, potentially make recommendations to similar client clients who look like them um, and then pair those recommendations to that client. As long as we know that they don't already have the product with another bank. Uh, we don't have full primacy with with all of our clients, right? So we don't own every single client relationship for every single banking product, um, which is its own initiative. Um, but but um, so in that case, it's important to consider both. Do they have the product already? Um, do we know that they have it? And if they don't, um, is it a client match? So that's how I'd answer that. That's great. Uh, and the next I question think is open there too. Sorry about that. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. There. You go for it. It's how can we increase recommendation relevancy for existing clients? Is that what you're referring to? The second part of that yeah. question? Yeah. Um, don't want to miss that. Um, I see a few upvotes, so I'm going to make sure to answer both the questions uh, kind of kind of equally or to the best of my abilities. Um, <laughs> so when we, um, when we think about um, relevance to the client, um, a lot of that currently is owned um, or, or, or our understanding of the client is owned by the banker. So our initial round of feedback is just as important as whether or not the product leads to revenue uh, or the product recommendation leads to revenue. So when we notice uh, heavy disqualifications within a particular um, uh, product, we obviously need to uh, assess what's going on with that particular product, but also understand why our recommendations may not be making sense to that client. So we do gather data on disqualifications as much as we do with our qualifications. Um, so that's the initial round of feedback. Um, we aren't to the point where we're actually um, 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 leveraging this product in a way that sees revenue um, because these, you know, this was this had just gone live essentially, um, still in testing. But once we start to see revenue feedback as well um, and engagement from clients, then we can continue to increase that relevance. So, uh, yeah. That's great. Yeah, thanks for thanks for getting to both pieces of that. No um, the next question we have is, how do you get all this client data? What happens if you're missing a bunch of input? Yeah, um, great question. Um, it's kind of the the theme of the uh, the talks here um, in many ways. So, of course, we have um, when we enter into a, a banking relationship with a client, typically that's uh, initiated with uh, some sort of a loan product. And so we have to have some level of credit understanding uh, for those clients. So we're lucky enough to be blessed with um, a, quite a bit of information um, kind of on credit worthiness, financial information on the client. Um, so that's a great place to start. It helps us really um, uh, build these uh, client segments. 
um, kind of cluster our clients together. Um, but in the case where we're missing quite a bit of this input, for the system we have in, in place currently, um, those clients are not going to be modeled on. Um, we just don't have the current data uh, or the, the enough data uh, for it to pass through some of our risk factors. Um, but in the event, of course, that we're missing a bunch of this data, this kind of comes back to the principle which I discussed earlier, which is building trust in our um, our, our uh, analytics products um, and understanding that quality data in leads to quality data out and making sure that our end user understands this as well. Because in this case, our end user um, is not one we happen to be gathering natural data on. Um, our end user are bankers who are responsible for the input data that were uh, much of the input data that we're being served from. Um, so as long as we're providing great recommendations, then they see the value in actually um, updating information on sales size, as I mentioned earlier, or other important metrics. So feedback loops. Oh, that's a great, that's a great point. And very interesting that the end users are kind of also incented to, to make sure that the quality of the input is going, you know, is, is high. I think there actually was a question related to exactly this. How are you auditing data quality for these systems? So are you noticing some discrepancies across some of those, you know, those bankers or I don't know if you have any commentary there. Yeah, I can't provide a ton. Um, unfortunately, I wish I could provide more. Um, but um, we can go to the next question. Yeah, sure. That'd be, that'd be great. Yeah, let's, um, let's just no banking has a lot of regulations. Um, and so it's, it's, Highly audited information, um, but yeah, yeah. well, well taken, well taken. So yeah. <laughs> um, I think this will be the last question and then we can wrap up here, Ty. How do you deal with uh, the kind of recommendation systems at scale? It seems like there's a large number of user features and a large number of items that are just expanding. So how are you, mm -hmm. how are you thinking about scale here? Absolutely. Um, so we're right now we're trying to solve the problem of the query. Um, we have a static recommender model um, that, that stands in, in place ready to be refreshed at any point. Um, whenever uh, that human in the loop decides that it's time to be refreshed, right? So the data scientist or the product manager who would, would like to see recommendations for you know, their, their clients and, and products. Um, so we're thinking about um, in terms of next steps, how can we uh, automate this process based on a particular query? And how can we really make sure that those recommendations are being um, passed through to the clients, right? So of course our bankers are responsible for relationships with clients, but depending on the performance of these recommendations, it might be prudent to provide them to the clients themselves in certain cases. So we're thinking about what are those queries, what are those triggers um, that, that leads to a recommendation? Um, and then once we start to scale at, at that uh, size, we need to be thinking of course about um, reducing latency. So research is going in there, um, but at this point it's, um, I guess not not top of the to do list. So, um, good question though. Great. Well, you know, best of luck building this out, and thanks so much for, you know, sh sharing this with us. You mentioned at the top of your talk about how you believe in data centric AI and its importance, and it's going to increase in value. And you know, you're you're thank you for being an active you know participant in the community by by giving this talk. We really appreciate it. So yeah, thanks so much for facilitating. I appreciate all the great questions. Of course. And for the audience, you know, if they want to stay in touch or follow along with some of the work that you're doing, is there a way to get in touch with you or to follow along with the work at KeyBank here? Or? Absolutely. Uh, I, I encourage you to add me on LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn slash Ty Tinker. Um, so just same as my name there. Um, and of course, if um, you'd like to stay up to date with some of that work, um, I'm really going to be posting there. Um, I'll be speaking again here in a couple of weeks on similar topics. You don't have to come to both lectures, um, <laughs> but I'll be speaking at, at a, um, some conferences here in the future and, and um, just really appreciate the engagement. So thank you so much. Peter. Awesome. Well, to the audience, let us know what you thought about this talk with the poll that we just published. And we're actually coming up on the close here. So we have a uh, closing keynote that you're automatically going to be redirected to. You're not going to want to miss this. It's going to be an exciting talk by Peter Matson, a senior staff engineer at Google. So we'll see you there.